Defence Dialogue, a podcast discussing contemporary challenges in the area of European security and defence. Brought to you by the Martin Centre with Nicholas Novaki. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Martin Centre's Defence Dialogue podcast. Uh, my name, as always, is um, Dr. Nicholas Novaki. I'm a research officer at the Wilfrid Martin Centre for European Studies. And uh, with me, with me here again is uh, is uh, my colleague and good friend Alvaro uh, de la Cruz, our communications and media officer. Like, thanks again for coming, Alvaro. How are you doing? Hello, Nicholas. Hello, everyone. Thank you for having me with you once again in these uh, beautiful Brussels weather uh, to discuss uh, the, the most timely <laughs> defense issues. <laughs> like it's getting it's getting a little bit grayer here again. Like as it has has been uh, getting like over over EU foreign policy lately. But uh, let's talk about that in, in, in a, a little bit more detail. So in today's episode, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, EU-Russia relations. And, and that's because of um, High, Rep- High Representative uh, Joseph Borrell's like recent uh, botched visit to Moscow, which he did on the 4th and uh, 6th of February on the invitation of uh, Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov, uh, and and uh, this trip has an EU foreign policy has a as a ge- in general uh, as a result of this trip like has gotten an unusual amount of attention in various international headlines recently, um, and not for the good reasons. I mean, this trip was quite challenging like from the very beginning like even before Borrell like went to Russia Poland Lithuania Latvia Estonia and Romania opposed it uh, arguing that it undermines the credibility of the EU's efforts to condemn the imprisonment of uh, Russian opposition leader Alexei Navalny and the violent crackdown on on uh, pro Navalny protesters um, in Moscow and elsewhere in Russia that followed then while in Moscow um, during a very staged uh, press conference, uh, like Borrell was unfortunately baited into discussing EU-Cuba relations and uh, condemning the U.S. embargo on Cuba, which which didn't uh, look good uh, for EU-U.S. relations. And um, Lavrov obviously took advantage of this opening to highlight uh, like glaring disagreement between uh, Washington D.C. and Brussels in order to attack the EU's own sanctions policy. And then also like call the EU an unreliable partner without being challenged uh, by Borrell. And um, Borrell and the EU as a whole was also caught off guard by Russia's decision to expel uh, German, Swedish and Polish diplomats due to their alleged participation in pro-Navalny protests, uh, which is an accusation that uh, Berlin, Stockholm and Warsaw have denied, saying that diplomats were only kind of uh, conducting normal diplomatic work and observing what is happening in the country. So since the trip, like Borrell has come under heavy scrutiny. Um, MEPs have criti- criticized um, Borrell for going to Moscow in the first place and for not standing up to Lavrov more forcefully. Uh, 81 of them, uh, the last time I checked, have also signed a letter calling for Borrell's uh, dismissal. And uh, it has even been said that um, in the press that the Moscow uh, debacle basically marked the death of the EU's foreign policy ambitions. So like a rather grave, strong uh, verdict overall. Like, however, like I don't think that Borrell like, should resign because of this. And the reason is that this would only reinforce the message to the outside world that the EU is weak and internally divided when it is bullied by Moscow. Rather than resign, like Borrell and the European External Action Service that he heads, um, the, which is the EU's diplomatic service, like should draw um, lessons like from the trip, what went wrong, and ensure that the high representative and the EU's diplomatic service is better prepared in the future, and then move on. I think like this is like what basically should be done. Unfortunately, like today, uh, on the 15th of February, the day that we were recording uh, this podcast, uh, Finnish Foreign Minister Pekka Haavisto, um, who had the first, uh, basically the first high-level person from the European Union to meet uh, face-to-face with Lavrov since the uh, Borrell trip, 
uh, seems to have succeeded uh, in doing some damage control for the credibility of EU foreign policy. Um, he also had a joint press conference with Lavrov in St. Petersburg, in which Harvey still made clear that like Finland supports all EU statements, actions on Russia, condemned Navalny's imprisonment and the violent crackdown on protests. And then also like corrected Lavrov's EU statements whenever like Lavrov like was like saying outrageous things about uh, the EU's policy towards like Ukraine, Russia, etc. So overall, like it was a very good performance, and it was a press conference that Borrell like should have had in uh, in Moscow. I think one thing to consider in the future is the introduction of an unwritten rule that all high-level trips by the high representative like should require an explicit backing from the entire council. So, so from all member states to provide them with a stronger uh, political mandate. Like, although like, Borrell absolutely like, had the right uh, to, to travel to, to Moscow, even though like, not all member states supported it, um, I think it's important to note that like, multiple EU countries that share direct with Russia um, opposed the trip. And I think this creates problems because I, I think the high representative can't speak confidently on behalf of the entire European Union on important issues such as Russia, if, it, if he, do, he or she doesn't have the full backing of those member states that are the most directly affected and exposed uh, to Russia. Some would see this as a step back for EU policy because it would uh, tie the high representatives foreign travels to the member states' ability to reach a consensus in them, which isn't always easy. And they would also point out that Javier Solana, the first high representative, often acted on his own initiative and was highly effective. Like in the early 2000s, like Solana, for example, played a key role in the Iran nuclear talks and in operationalizing the EU's crisis management structures, like through his own uh, personal efforts and diplomacy. But I think, uh, from my in my opinion, like comparing Borrell to Solana is somewhat misplaced. And this is because Solana had a lot more flexibility to define his role uh, as, as the high representative because the function of his office was initially defined only in a single treaty paragraph, uh, whereas the office of the modern high representative is much more formalized and rigid. I mean, he or, he or she is also the chair of the Foreign Affairs Council, uh, vice president of the European Commission, and head of the uh, External Action Service. And in addition to this, the EU has also grown. It's important to remember that like half of Solana's time uh, in office, for half of Solana's time as the EU's high representative, the EU consisted only of 15 member states. But then the 2004 uh, Big Bang enlargement to Central and Eastern Europe in particular uh, made the foreign policy views expressed in the Council much more diverse, which obviously makes the operating environment of the modern high representative more challenging. So, and finally, like what I want to say is that it's also good to keep in mind when we discuss about the Russia trip and when we discuss the high representative and, and Borrell as a person that uh, the, the biggest problem of EU foreign policy is structural, like rather than based on any, any one individual. Like the, the Moscow trip and its aftermath have like, yet again highlighted the EU's inability to pursue a common strategic approach towards great powers, um, in this case, Russia. And, and this is the fault of the member states because um, in EU foreign policy is, is, is a very intergovernmental policy field. And obviously, as, as um, all of us and many of our listen, listeners also know, EU capitals continue to hold very conflicting views on Russia, like some see it as an existential threat, some as an economic partner, and some as a potential ally against China. So Borrell himself like, cannot be blamed for the overall sorry state of the EU's Russia policy. Um, so like, this is basically the state of play uh, at the moment. I think the trip was, was a failure. It, it, it uh, did not go the way it had. It was supposed to go in the way it should have gone. But I think it's time to like, look into the, for the European Union to look into the mirror, learn the lessons, and, and uh, then move on. Precisely in that sense, let's move on. What what do you think could be could be done now that the trip is is done that we cannot change that and beyond little hands that can come from from member states like our Finnish minister, uh, how do we reconduct the situation? How do we take from here? How Europe can get a, 
back into a, a common position and 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 face uh, Moscow and 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 build the new relationship vis a vis Russia. Well, I think um, like the the first obvious one is obviously preparedness. I don't. It seemed at least um, when watching the. Uh, press conference uh, with uh, with Borrell and Lavrov that like the, the high representative for whatever reason like wasn't as prepared as he should have been to to uh, deal with the um, surprising questions about Cuba like not to step into the traps that the Russians said and and uh, just uh, more broadly to defend uh, EU unity and I think preparedness is absolutely key. Like when aging, when engaging any great power, uh, especially one as tricky as Russia, then um, I, I think we should also consider at the at the EU level a coordinated effort to expel uh, Russian one Russian diplomat from every EU member state to show solidarity towards Germany, Poland, and Sweden. Like from which Russia announced that like it would be expelling diplomats. And I think this is something that would send a message to Russia that the EU will react as one when bullied. And we've had like coordinated efforts uh, when it comes to the expulsion of diplomats in, in the past as well. Like one happened in, in, in uh, after the Salisbury um, poisonings in, in, in the UK a couple of years ago. So like there's a precedent for this as well. Um, another is that the EU should use the forthcoming strategic compass process to sharpen its Russia policy. Um, there was a public memo that the External Action Service like published at the end of 2020 on the threat analysis that it prepared for the strategic compass, but this was a missed opportunity to communicate frankly about the different types of threats and challenges, including Russia, that the EU is currently facing. And I think the strategic compass itself, when it comes out in 2022 like should prioritize like frankness um, over diplomatic and political niceties. And then finally, the European Parliament will produce a report this year on the EU's Russia strategy, which I think will allow MEPs to put pressure on the Council, uh, i.e. the member, state when it, member states when it comes to the EU's Russia policy. Um, and I think this report especially should underline that the national economic short-termism of some member states is currently the greatest obstacle to a genuinely common EU approach towards Russia. And um, it should also call for new funding for pro-democracy civil society organizations and for vigorous implementation of the EU's Green Deal, like which could reduce the EU's reliance on Russian fossil fuels to zero by 2050 if, if it is implemented successfully. Okay. Um so let me get back to this uh, preparedness uh, uh, issue. Um, I think I think I can I can ask a, a double question on this regard. Uh, first of all, this is not the first um, let's say fiasco uh, in, the, in the past year uh, from the European External Action Service. We had especially uh, big uh, scandals vis-à-vis -vis China when it comes for, uh, when it comes to. Um, the reports on, on disinformation and misinformation campaigns and attacks from China towards the European Union during the, the first wave of COVID, also the, the joint declaration by the EU ambassadors in Beijing. Uh, we have this uh, scandal vis-a-vis -vis Russia, even though, as you mentioned, many of the member states oppose this trip and, and, and already um, uh, alerted uh, Mr. Borrell about the, the, the tricky uh, situation in which he could find himself vis a -vis, uh, uh, Lebrov. So do we lack some talent or, or do we lack some uh, better prepared uh, officials within the European External Action Service or at least in, in Mr. Borrell's cabinet? And also as he is the head of it, do you think this, this new scandal will will have an impact on, on the Spanish government or Spain's in general reputation within the EU and NATO? No, I, I don't, I don't think so. Um, like, and, uh, like, and, and let me be clear that I think like Joseph Borrell, uh, like himself is an ex extremely seasoned and experienced uh, diplomat, like both 
uh, at the EU level, um, uh, like he was, for example, the president of the European Parliament for a while, and uh, then at the national level, like being a Spanish foreign minister. And um, like I have um, utmost confidence in, in the skills and, and um, qualifications of like everyone like who works in his team in the both in the external action service and even the European Commission. Like, however, like I mean, anyone can do mistakes. Like mistakes happen, and um, like I, I think the the way the Moscow trip was handled like was clearly um, a mistake, and there was for whatever reason like there was a lack of preparation. And I think, like, it's only reasonable now that the um, both the high representative, his team, and the external action service will kind of do a lessons learned process, see like what could be done uh, better in the in the future, and and uh, then basically like move on. I don't think there's too much need to like prolong the discussion on on um, Borrell like himself. Uh, and ultimately, I mean, it's the, the external action service is always. Um, and the high representative himself, like, is always in a tough spot, like, when it comes to, um, especially, like, dealing with with um, great powers such as Russia or China, uh, on, on which, like, there isn't really a genuinely common EU approach. Because let's remember that the, 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 the purpose of the high representative and the purpose of the external action service is to represent the, the common view of the European Union on the world stage. And on many of these issues, like there isn't really a common European Union view. Uh, there isn't one really on, on, on Russia. There isn't one on China and on many other issues. And that's not the fault of the external action service or the high representative or any, in anybody in the commission. Like it's, it's the fault of the member states. And, and um, it's, it's absolutely crucial that the, the, the member states also like do their fair share to make the work of the high representative, his team and the external action service easier by trying to facilitate a more common European Union approach towards these very difficult challenges. It is. It is complicated, especially in this matter to, to reach a, uh, um, one European voice. But it's true that, that in this particular case, when you have so many member states uh, advocating in, in the opposite direction, uh, we, we must assert that at, at, at least uh, Mr. Borrell knew that he had um, not, by, not by even uh, close the, the, the common position of the European Union represented in, in his trip. If we're going, going to another thing that you mentioned about the uh, Washington DC, uh, Brussels, um, uh, disagreement on, on, on the Cuban uh, issue, um, a couple of days after uh, Mr. Borrell's trip to Moscow, uh, the EU ambassador to Havana signed a letter to President Biden, among other other uh, businessmen and, and influencer, influential people in, in Cuba, asking to start asking to the American president to start dismantling the, the sanction system uh, in the country. This created a some kind of a, a second wave of the scandal. Um, do you think we can find ourselves in the next in the next weeks and months in a in a tough position vis-a-vis -vis Washington regarding Cuba? Well, that's in, that's interesting. I hadn't uh, read or or seen that uh, that letter, um, but I, I think the the important thing to note here is that the EU's policy towards the U.S. embargo on Cuba like has been the same like for a long time. Like there's there, there's no change here. Um, the European Union like has expressed like for a long time that it would like the embargo to 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 be dis dismantled. But I, I, th I think there's a um, there's a little bit of a danger here um, that by d d expressing these sort of um, sentiments, however old they might be, like so soon after Joe Biden took office as as um, as president that we send the wrong message basically to Washington, DC. I, I think these sort of sorts of issues that uh, not have, have not only a European dimension, but also kind of a broader transatlantic dimension of, and uh, are of, like very fundamental interest to the United States. Like we should really like make a concerted effort to try to discuss these uh, with our American partners in a joint transatlantic forum. 
And um, I know the commission and the external action service like produced this like joint transatlantic agenda paper at the end of uh, 2020. And, and uh, like also mentioning that uh, like uh, that there, there should be a, a high level visit by Joe Biden to, to, to Brussels, hopefully uh, sometime in the first half of this year. But I think like we, we should really like follow up like this agenda and, and, and make sure that our, uh, transatlantic partners are kind of fully engaged like when we discuss these sort of issues because we don't really want to create any bad blood in, in Washington like so soon now that like we have a strongly pro-European uh, strongly pro-transatlantic president again in the White House so like not to like step on any 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 uh, shoes or not to kind of create any unnecessary damage in the relationship. I think you're totally right especially the emphasis in the it is too soon let's not put this uh, a hot potato on, on Biden's hands uh, yeah, it's, as of it's yet. A, you know, it's because it's, a, cause it's many of, like there hasn't been any policy change, like I said, but I mean, it's, it's just, it, it raises certain eyebrows. I mean, when you start discussing these sort of things, like so soon after Biden took office. So I, I think we just have to find the, the correct moment in time to, to, to discuss these things. And I don't think there's any reason at the moment to be discussing like the, uh, uh, EU policy towards the US embargo on Cuba at the moment, for example. But that's just me. I mean, other people might have another other opinion. So. Yeah, totally. Coming coming back to Putin uh, and Russia, um, as you as you correctly said, uh, since the enlargement, we have many more member states uh, with uh, very sensitive positions uh, when it comes to to Russia. But one of the main uh, leaders, especially when we talk about, about defense in the European Union, is Germany. And we have a new CDU leader whose position about Putin is at least uh, not, very, not very clear. Do we, we don't even know uh, if the guy will make it to the, to the chancellery and, and what he will do about it. But could you foresee a, an issue uh, having Germany uh, in, um, let's say, not very clear or not very strong position towards Russia? Uh, well, Germany has always kind of like tried to balance the, uh, like on the one hand, uh, the desire to keep Russia as, as, a, as, a, as a strong economic partner and engaging Russia, Russia economically, um, like the Germans continue the line that... Um, the Nord Stream 2 uh, pipeline project, for example, is purely an economic project and not a political one. And um, I'm like, I, I expect that the same line like will continue in, in the future as well. Um, it's important to note that this is not only like the German line; there are the EU member states as well, like who have um, similar uh, views, um, legitimate views, uh, in my opinion. But then, the the, the tricky thing is that. Like I said earlier, like some member states see the see Russia as an economic partner, some as an ex existential threat, and some as a potential al ally towards uh, China, uh, for example. Um, so we we need to kind of make make a stronger effort into like trying to like come up with a more uh, unified EU approach towards Russia. Like Germany has, uh, despite its economic interest, like in Russia, like has. Uh, during the uh, during the time of Chancellor Merkel, like taken uh, a pretty strong uh, stance as well. Like despite the fact that the Nord Stream two uh, pipeline project continues to advance and it's almost finished, but uh, supporting EU sanctions on Russia, like after the illegal annexation of Crimea, for example, uh, supporting a stronger EU EU policy uh, towards uh, Russia overall. But again, I mean there are divisions, and and there's no doubt about that. Um, but I think kind of one of the things that could indirectly like help in this area as well as the green deal because of the fact that it has the ambition of reducing the eu's uh, reliance on fossil fuels to zero by 2050 and um, I, I think this if it is implemented effectively like in the coming years and decades i mean ultimately like will cause a policy change in Berlin as well, uh, which will make it easier for the EU to have a more unified Russia policy. But like this is not a, it, it won't happen like in, in a matter of months or even years. I mean, I think we're talking about decades here. So it's it's important to keep patient. And in, in, in the meantime, try to make sure that like we won't have 
mishaps uh, like we did have recently in Moscow, like during the uh, trip of high representative Borel. Let's pray for that. And of course, let's keep always in mind that not only the, the survival of the planet, but human rights, democracy, and freedom should come first. Than business, I would say. Either way, I I think I don't have any more questions to you, uh, Nicholas. Thank you once again for having me. No, my pleasure. Quite Alvaro. interesting. After my, my pleasure, Alvaro. It's always a pleasure to discuss these issues with you. I'm I'm very happy that you were able to join again, and uh, I hope all our listeners this time as well like enjoy this brief discussion and uh, stay tuned uh, for other episodes as well. Uh, this wasn't kind of purely like defense related, but uh, I thought this is an, it's an important issue to discuss in this um, episode as well, because it has direct implications when we talk about topics such as the EU strategic autonomy. So um, hof- hopefully all of you are having a good day and stay tuned for other episodes in the coming weeks and months. Thanks. Bye. That was today's episode of Defence Dialogue. Subscribe to our podcasts for more.